Welcome to the CEC Report. It's the 23rd of September. I'm Robert Bowick, and I'm joined today by CEC researcher, Jeremy Beck. Welcome, Jeremy. Thanks, Robbie. In this week's CEC Report, Libya Report proves Australia and allies are liars. We must get out of Syria now. And if Australia has had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth, where is it? So first, Libya report proves Australia and allies are liars. We must get out of Syria now. And Jeremy, we're in the middle of a big mobilisation that we need all the viewers of this report to participate in. I'll give a bit of background, but the urgency has come about because of events this week, or last Saturday to be precise, where Australia, Australian military personnel participated in the bombing with the United States of the Syrian army Mm -hmm. um, in Syria, in an area that was resisting ISIS. These guys were engaged in fighting ISIS. Right? It's an outrage. Here we are assisting Islamic State. This yep. is an outrage. Yeah, exactly. We are bombing the Syrian army in their country. They're in their country, mm. right? They're fighting every, who, the people we acknowledge are the most horrific monsters probably the world's ever seen, mm. right? Um, these demented ISIS for forces, and we killed 62 of them. Mm. Um, and there's good reason to believe that the Russians and the Syrians are not wrong when they mm -hmm. say this was intentional. We'll get to that in a minute, but I just wanted to um, provide a bit of context. In the last few months, the world has been rocked, but should have been rocked more, by now three releases, official releases of information that um, prove everything you need to know about what our country and our allies you know, who we've followed, the US and UK um, and France, etc., have been doing in the Middle East in the name of the so-called war on terror. So the first was, the big one was the Chilcot report, which damned Tony Blair um, in the UK. So that was a UK report. The second one was the 28 pages of the 9-11 joint congressional inquiry from 2002 that showed the Saudis were behind this terrorism we've been fighting, beginning with 9-11. The third one came out just in the last week as well, which is the UK's House of Representatives, or House of, sorry, House of Commons, Foreign Affairs Committee's Libya report. And in one sense, that Libya report is more damning because it's more explicit than even the Chilcot report because what it says is that the whole basis of the 2011 intervention in Libya, which were claims being made about Gaddafi that are being repeated now in Syria against Assad, that Gaddafi is killing his own people, etc. Those claims were all lies, mm -hmm. right? Now, I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. I want to quote the report. But before I do, um, uh, this earlier this week, we launched a mobilisation where we encouraged Australians to call the United States Embassy because the um, US government, the US Congress on the, the, the 9th of September passed this Justice Against Sponsors of Terrorism Act and Obama immediately announced he would veto it. So um, it's Friday here, which means it's Thursday night in the US. It's expected that what Obama will do is on Friday evening, just as the Congress is about to pack up and go home until after the presidential election, he will send a veto over so there's no one around to override it. Because right now the numbers are in the Congress to override it. If there's a big enough, if they vote again by a big enough majority, that overrides the presidential veto, right? So we have been asking people to call in to the US Embassy and demand that, that he not veto that because that could lead to lawsuits which strip apart this whole international terrorism apparatus going back to the Saudis and how they do it. Well, now we're going to ask people to go, Australians to also mobilise on the question of something that relates to that, which is the consequences of it, which is Syria. Because the events that have happened in Syria this week underscore the fact we should not be there because we're, there, we're in there under the same pretext of lies that we invaded Iraq and that we invaded Libya. And are we going to just let these reports come out and prove it and just go, huh? Or are we going to do something about it? Are we going to let our governments get away with not holding the decision makers of this to account? That's the question here that's before us. So let me just give some details about what I'm talking about. Um, here's the, here's the, uh, the, the opening summary of the House of Commons Foreign Affairs Committee report on Libya. And I'll just read you the first paragraph. 
In March 2011, the United Kingdom and France, with the support of the United States, and I'll just stop there, and Kevin Rudd was our foreign minister at the time, and he wanted us to be in it, and he wanted us to commit the SAS into it, mm -hmm. right? That's very important. I'll continue. Led the international community to support an intervention in Libya to protect civilians from attacks by forces loyal to Muammar Gaddafi. This policy was not informed by accurate intelligence. In particular, the government failed to identify that the threat to civilians was overstated. In other words, they were not, Gaddafi was not butchering anybody. Mm. And that the rebels included a significant Islamist element. In other words, the so-called rebels that we went in there to assist were Al-Qaeda-linked terrorists. They were, we were on their side in Libya. Now, long-term viewers of this show can go back and watch our episode. Mm. We were saying that at the time, Jeremy, mm. right? Um, this is now in black and white by the people who did it. And I'll point out that the same people, the same three countries predominantly, US, UK, and France, are, made, are, the, are the countries that, are, that have made the same claims about Syria. Bashar al-Assad is butchering his own people and the uprising is by moderate opposition forces who are sick of his brutal regime. No, Assad al-Assad is not butchering his own people. Unfortunately, there's a terrible civil war there now that they, our side have created using not just, another, not just more al-Qaeda-linked jihadist terrorists, um, who have now become ISIS, they were the same ones. Hmm. The, the, once, once, they won, once they overthrew Gaddafi in Libya in 2011, a whole bunch of them grabbed his weapons, and this is a big part of the, the, the House of Commons report as well, there were these hmm. stockpiles of weapons that Gaddafi had in warehouses. His, his troops didn't even have them. The 30 billion pounds that he spent on weapons over his whole time as being the leader of Libya, they're in warehouses, and the report says that the countries who did the intervention, US and UK and France, did not bother to go and secure those weapons. They let them fall in the hands of these jihadists who spread them all across North Africa and the Middle East and into Syria. Right? That's no accident. There's this no the accident in, at the all. The intention of the whole thing is regime change. It's regime no. change using terrorists. Mm -hmm. Right? We're our side, people, to the viewers, our side. We're not the goodies in the world anymore. We were the goodies in World War II. We're not the goodies anymore. We are destroying nations using the most horrific elements imaginable. This is something that we cannot let the governments get away with. Now, I've only, I've only read to you the opening quote from this report. Look it up yourself. We'll provide the, where you can find it on the website. There'll be a press release on our website about this particular report where the links will be to it. It's not that long. Read it, if you, read it for yourself. It's much more explicit than the Chilcot report. It just basically said all these claims was all rubbish, 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 mm. right? And they intended re regime change all along. So, Call in, participate in this mobilisation. If you don't know the information, call in and get a copy of this, the Australian Alert Service from this week, which has a report on what I've just said. Get the details you need, call our office if you have to, get them off the website, call your Member of Parliament. If everyone calls a Member of Parliament with this question, why are we in Syria? Because now that we're there, we're not invited in, we're there illegally, right? We're there in another country's sovereign territory. Why are we there? bombing the people who are fighting ISIS. Why are we doing that, right? Mm. And demand, we must get out of Syria now. That's what we're asking every viewer to participate in. We're launching that today. Um, and it, it's up to us, ordinary citizens of our countries, ordinary citizens of Australia, the United States, the United Kingdom, France, etc. We have to hold our governments to account because they're in all these you know, relationships with arms traders and, all, and, and um, uh, you know, corporate interests you know, security firms, etc., that benefit from these wars, whereas the whole world, none of the rest of the world does. Mm. And if they keep it up, at a, you know, we're on a collision course to, to war with Russia and China, and that'll be the worst of all. So anyway, let me leave it there. To ram this point home for the sake of the viewer, we've been sitting on this footage for a while, but what we want to play now is three minutes of a US State Department briefing from the 2nd of November, 2015, so, you know, 10 months ago now, where the, the, just like the US has claimed that Russia has bombed the an aid convoy now, and they made this claim to take this change the subject from the fact they bombed these Syrian soldiers fighting ISIS, right? All of a sudden, and our media's all over it. Oh, the Russians are the baddies because they've just bombed this aid convoy, and they've made this claim. So last November, they made a similar claim that Russia was bombing hospitals in Syria, and they they named a they, they said it was a specific hospital. So we're going to before we go to the break, 
Just watch this back and forth between a Russian journalist and the US State Department spokesperson on just asking, well, can you identify this hospital, please? And look at how obviously they lie. If our media put this, these kinds of briefings on TV every day, the public would see right through them in a heartbeat. You never see this on TV, but it's all over the internet. Look how obviously they lie. Mm -hmm. Okay. Of course. Uh, the defense, the Russian defense ministry says it has investigated allegations of its targeting hospitals in Syria and said that in five of the out of six towns that were mentioned in various reports, there were no hospitals. They say there is a hospital only in the settlement of Sarmin, which is in the Idlib province. Last week, John Kirby told us that the U.S. had operational intelligence that Russia had hit a hospital. Which hospital exactly did he mean? Was it the one in Sarmin? So thank you for the question on that. Um, as uh, Mr. Kirby discussed last week, we're not going to get into the details of operational assessment or intelligence. Uh, we stand by his word. Can you really offer no details on the hospital that the U.S. accuses Russia of hitting? We're going to stand by Mr. Kirby's words. Thank you're not even going to say where, where it is, that hospital that, that you're saying Russia hit? What we're saying is that we have seen information that Russia is targeting civilian infrastructure. But um, he, and we he, would point he spoke, you to the he spoke Syrian about NGOs on the ground, as well as open source reporting on that. He spoke about a specific hospital in Syria. Where exactly is it? What details can you offer about that hospital? Again, I'm not going to get into this sort of detail of operational assessment for this. Maybe you should speak to the Russians on their targeting. Well, they actually, they have. Uh, clearly, either she or her colleagues have spoken to the Russians about it, and they That's say that you're wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay? Isn't it incumbent on you to come up with some, e I mean, even a location? It doesn't seem like it would be that difficult or violate any kind of intelligence, uh, intelligence thing, to, uh, intelligence uh, sources and methods to say, where exactly it is that you're that you're talking about when you when you make the accusation um, that's the first thing and then the second thing is you've just expanded it quite broadly to say not just hospitals you said that the Russians are actually targeting civilian infrastructure the Russians, thank you Matt actually the Russians have hit I'm, thank you for the are for they the target your, 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 no, they've you, hit and okay so that. they're they not, not targeting, targeting civilian infrastructure no and thank okay. you for that uh, ma'am uh, well, details are especially relevant. This morning, uh, the Russian Defense Ministry has released images and video of the hospital in Sarmin, mm -hmm. uh, which was allegedly hit by by Russia. And the these images, um, they, they show the building of the hospital, which doesn't look like it was recently bombed. I printed them out just in case you haven't seen them. I can I can show them. Can you see why it's important for the U.S. to show its evidence of the alleged destruction of a hospital by Russia? How about this? I'll take your question. If there's information we can share, we'll get back to you. Okay. I'd be happy to. Welcome back to the CEC report. If Australia has had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth, where is it? Now, Jeremy, I'll let you talk now. <laughs> Sorry about dominating before the break. Um, the reason Jeremy's joining me today is because in the last few weeks, he has produced for our publication, the Australian Alert Service, and like I said, call in and get yourself a copy, copy, a series of charts to illustrate a point that we've always made, right? Mm -hmm. Which is that the claim that's repeated ad nauseum about why Australia has the best economy in the world is because we have, thanks to Hawke and Keating, we have experienced uninterrupted economic growth for 25 years. And that was since the recession we had to have. Uh, now, so we're great. Now, this is GDP growth. Uh, but the problem is, where is the real growth? Yeah. And, and if you look at real measures, not this monetary measure, but if you look at production of steel, production of aluminium, you know, the energy production, electricity, all these real measures, and in per capita terms of you know, how many tonnes of a certain commodity we're producing per capita, in actual fact, in recent years, we've been collapsing. All right, so let's go through, let, let's let the charts speak mm. for themselves, but you can um, illustrate. We'll start from the beginning. And these are all have been published in our publication, so people can get a copy if they want to. Um, all right, so the first one, Jeremy, Australian steel production per capita. What does that show? 
it shows that really, if you look at a per capita basis, our steel production had its heyday in the 1970s. And at that time, we we're producing you know, a, an enormous quantity back then, um, about 0.6 tonnes per capita. And now we're down to 0.2 tonnes per capita. And we, we had a lot of closure in the steelworks. We had the Newcastle steelworks close. And right now, our steel industry is really uh, under threat where it may completely go out of existence if we keep going down the way we're going. And you and I have discussed this before. What, what physical thing in the economy doesn't involve steel? That's the thing. You know, steel was yep. the most important metal in construction, in manufactured products. You use it in reinforced concrete. You use it in just about and what, anything. And what do we make steel out of? Mm, iron. And in, you need iron and you need coal. And what does Australia have in abundance? Enormous <laughs> amounts of both. <laughs> All right. So why, why is it not being made here? Okay. And the same question applies for each of these. So mm -hmm. next one is refined aluminium production per capita. In that case, we have had uh, quite a lot of growth, but in recent years, there's been a very sharp collapse. And that is, is no coincidence that it's happened at the same time that we're ramping up the cost of electricity through all this renewable, so-called renewable energy, in particular, wind power and Because solar. smelters are probably the single most energy consuming thing there is. Yeah, with aluminium, aluminium production, it requires a lot of electricity and cheap electricity. And recent years, we all know that the power bills have gone through the roof and the, the aluminium industry is in real crisis. There has been a, quite a considerable growth, but up until that point, there's been a massive shutdown. We had the Curry Curry smelter shut down in 2012, the Port Henry uh, smelter shut down in 2014. And really, if we keep going down this path and they're trying to ramp up this renewable energy target, we won't have any aluminium industry at all. And are we moving into a world where we're not gonna mm. be using aluminium? Of course not. It's used more and more. In a lot of products, it's required for strength and lightness. It's a, a corrosion resistance. It's a very so, important. So that's, metal. Another, that's another factor mm. here. These, it's not like these things aren't necessary anymore. They're more mm. necessary than ever. Mm. We could be making them quite easily, and we're not. And value adding too. There's enormous potential in manufacturing if we only process aluminium into finished goods. Let's take the next two together before we take a break. So re copper and refined tin. Well, there's a clear collapse in copper. Uh, once again, uh, it's the policies of the globalisation that have led to this collapse. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of the processing of copper being shut down to make it into the, the wire rod and, and all the different forms. A lot of these um, plants have been shut down. Uh, with uh, tin, well, we don't produce it at all now. Uh, we used to, and you see the graph, we used to have a quite a, a big tin industry back in, in 1970, but uh, now, uh, well, it was shut down in 2007 when the uh, green bushes smelter closed, and now we have to import all that. So in those areas of the production of crucial um, metals that we need for an economy, an industrial mm. economy, there's been no growth. Mm. Right, we're, you know, that does fit it's into been... the 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth. Mm. Right, let's take a break and then we're going to talk about some similar charts relating to energy. So welcome back to the CEC report where I'm talking to CEC researcher Jeremy Beck on the subject. If Australia has had 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth, where is it? And we're going through charts that Jeremy has produced in the last few weeks for our Australian Alert Service, which you can call in and get a free copy of. Um, all right, Jeremy, so we discussed the metal production ones. Let's talk about these ones now. Diesel production per capita in Australia. Once again, uh, we've seen a collapse in recent years. Uh, it's a, a very big crisis that because our trucks run on diesel and the trucks take our food to the market. Now, we only have about 17 days of diesel in stocks, and we have to import most of that diesel. If there's any international event where there's a stop and flow of that diesel, our whole nation would grind to a stop, and that's a, a big national security issue. And that, that's, that's an important point, and, and mm. military figures have made that point, right? Mm. This, this is a national security vulnerability that Australia has, and the same can be said of petrol production. Well, that's true. Mo most cars run on petrol, and once again, most of our fuel is imported. It comes from mainly from Asia. And that's a real crisis because we used to be nearly self-sufficient back in the 1980s where we were producing most of our oil and petrol and diesel. But also, you, you've got to consider the crude oil production that's before the refinery into petrol and diesel. The crude oil production has really collapsed a lot as well. Yep. 
All right, and then you've got a graph chart here, Australian net energy consumption per capita, and then we'll follow that up with another chart, Australian electricity consumption per capita. The net energy consumption per capita is particularly interesting because you notice that overall the, the top uh, one is the total figure and then there's a breakdown between coal, oil, gas and renewables. And overall there has been an increase in energy but since 2006 we've definitely seen a clear collapse in our per capita consumption of energy. So there's really been a net collapse in our economy because energy makes everything tick. So yeah. if you collapse energy you're really having a collapse in the real economy. So so since 2006, that's a whole decade, we're 2016 now, there's been a, a real collapse in our economy from energy. Uh, with the renewables, we were producing more renewable energy per capita back in 1960 than we are now. Now, a lot of people, that will come as a big shock to them. But the fact is that most renewable energy is in the form of hydroelectricity. And well, that's the only reliable one. That's the only reliable one. And the, the, the green movement is trying to shut this down. Uh, you, you have a look at the Snowy Mountain Scheme, they're sending the water back down the Snowy, and that means you, you can't generate as much hydroelectricity. And, and, and there's the, similar problems in Tasmania as well. Oh yeah, and, and we're, we're producing less so-called renewable per capita than 1960. It's, it's amazing. And of course, the, and the thing to say about the electricity consumption one is the only people that would be happy that we've had a, dro a drop in electricity consumption are the greenies themselves, which mm. is insane. It me mm. It's a measure that our, we're not having economic growth. Mm. So let's quickly move to, you, you had dealt with that specifically in this last week's issue of the alert service. And um, we'll finish with the current account one. So we'll just go through, you, you, what you've provided here are import figures that mm. reflect, the, that are the um, mirror image of the collapsing figures of production that, you sh that we've already showed. So mm. Mm. we've got, Petroleum and other liquids production and consumption and see that big gap there that that is really alarming because back earlier on the the production was nearly at the consumption level that big gap means that we're very vulnerable. The gap is imports mm. right we're, that's what we're getting from imports and then you've got these other two graphs that show the aluminium imports which has just exploded mm. and we're again with one of the biggest bauxite producers in the world mm. right that's mm. that's crazy. Um, and then you've got steel imports, which you know are up and down, but mostly you can see where they're clearly headed, mm, right? Oh. Where, where we're getting these imports from. And then you've got something we haven't dealt with yet, which is food imports, and mm -hmm. that is shocking. It is. Uh, we're a net food exporter, but increasingly a lot of our food on our supermarket shelves, and this particular chart here shows the the, the processed food, and and that is the sort of food that you see in cans and so forth that we used to produce, such as canned fruit and, and canned tomatoes and things like that. And a lot of processed food now is imported and our local production has been shut down. Now that is a real concern. There's an enormous increase in that. And, and then finally, the last chart, Australia's current account, which is another more complicated way of saying Australia's trade deficit, that is clearly a perm become a permanent feature. Before the 1970s it wasn't permanent, now it is permanent. That mm. That is that chart there does not back up the claim of 25 years of uninterrupted economic growth. Mm. Anyway, Jeremy, we're running out of time. Thanks very much for your contribution. Let me just reiterate, join our mobilisation, call in, get a copy of this Australian Alert Service. It's urgent. We have to make these issues stick. But thanks for tuning into this week's CEC report and tune in next week for more.